Good afternoon. Welcome back to the BH virtual event space. And today, as you just saw right there, everyday macro, everyday things. Mahesh is probably going to recreate that picture. It's going to be a me and a teardrop. <laughs> we'll, we'll switch it up a little bit. Mahesh Thapa, Sony ambassador, joining us. Mahesh, always good to have you on, man. What's going on? Derek, pleasure. It's uh, the holiday season, you know, and uh, here that means it's winter. <laughs> and it's a lot of dreary days, <laughs> a lot of rainy days, a lot of just staying at home. And I, and, I, and I wanted to time this talk, you know, just for this time, because I'm sure there are many people out there who are sort of feeling the winter blues. And I'm oh, here to yeah. tell you that uh, it doesn't have to be that bad. You know, as long as you have a, a macro lens, a camera at home, there's many things you can photograph in and around your home, home and your, 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 your backyard. Uh, and I feel like macro photography in particular really lends itself to that type of uh, uh, local environment. So today I'm going to talk about some everyday macro uh, with some specific attention to like, for example, that picture you saw uh, initially as the screen splash about how to create something like that. Uh, it's super easy. Uh, and the once you see it, you're like, oh, what didn't I think of that kind of thing? Okay. <laughs> so awesome. let's, yeah, that's, let's that's, do that's, it. That's, well, that's well if I disappear, I'm over there taking pictures of Christmas tree ornaments. <laughs> All right. I'll see you in a bit for some Q&A, Mahesh. All right, brother. Okay. Let me just make sure that let's let me know that uh everything still looks good and people looks can see good. my screen. All right, thank you. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. So today is everyday macro photography. Uh and I don't want to mean to be sort of facetious or flippant about that, but really is something that you can do every day around your heart. And I'm not talking about, you know, you get a macro lens and you get really close-up picture of somebody's eye or you find a coin you take a picture of that you know we can be a little bit more creative uh get our juices going if you will and it doesn't have to be just around the house uh you know you, know, you could have this stuff with you as you're just you know walking the beach on a on a wintry day stormy scene morning you can apply it to uh, other aspects of your activity your daily activities but uh something that's quick fun easy and i think that you love to do so let's get started uh I, I I gave a link uh, to Danny. I think he'll put this on the chat, but I have a little article that I published uh, a couple of years ago, uh, and uh, it's called What's in My Bag? A Super Simple Kit for Macro Photography. Now, you can substitute a lot of this equipment for what I talk about, but I'm going to uh, talk mainly about as far as the the camera and lenses. It's going to be Sony-centric. You know, Sony is sponsoring this, uh, but they're equivalent uh, equipment for other manufacturers, you know, uh, that you can apply. Uh, but the accessories, I think, are really cool. That's what's really going to drive the point home uh, that you could think about getting, uh, particularly for uh, tricky situations where you need things in certain positions all the time and you don't have five different assistants or multiple hands. Uh, so this is a little quick tips and tricks to, to help you out. Uh, let's talk about the two cameras that I use all the time for my macro photography. It all depends on uh, what I'm shooting, how much uh, room I need, basically between the subject and myself. The first one, uh, and I'm only going to talk about the features that are relevant to my type of macro photography. Obviously, these cameras have tons of bells and whistles, but the one I use currently is the Sony a7R5. Um, it's got a high megapixel count, and that actually uh, matters a little bit because oftentimes uh, you want to get bigger than life-size macro. So if your macro lens is one by one and you get a full frame image, you can crop down uh, to even smaller amount and still have a lot of me megapixels left over to do a one to two macro or one to one to one, 1 1.5 macro. So you can compensate for the fact that you don't uh, have uh, uh, maybe the the, the the true macro lens or or you need to get even closer, even bigger uh, blow up uh, by getting a camera that has a little bit more megapixels. In addition, particularly for static subjects, and this is one of the most, one of the best features I think the A7R5 has, uh, is this a pixel shift multi-shooting mode where it combines between four and 16 shots, depending on how you want to do it, to come up with a whopping 240, 241 megapixel image. Now you have an amazing amount of croppability, if you will, and detail. Uh, and because it's doing this by pixel shifting. Uh, you have better color profile, less noise, uh, less moiré artifacts. It's, it's really great. So if you if you have a subject that's not moving uh, and a lot of macro shots, you know that's, that that sort of fits that bill, uh, you'll be sort of able to utilize this uh, multi shift. And there are other other manufacturers and cameras out there that have this 
a multi multi shoot or or or, or multi pixel binning or whatever you call it uh, to come up with a higher megapixel image. So I would take I'd, I'd give give you advice to utilize that as much as you can, particularly if your subject is is stable. And finally, uh, it has this camera and other cameras where it has focus bracketing. So if you want that really high depth of field, which is difficult to do on a single shot with a macro lens, just because you're so close to the subject matter, uh, you could utilize focus bracketing. And this has one of the, the better implementations, I think, of focus bracketing. So that's sort of my main go-to full frame sensor. And I also use the A6700 uh, mainly because of the 1.5 prop, and it still also has the focus bracketing. Sometimes I'm you know, maybe photographing a bug or or maybe there's a, a spider web in the corner of the house because we forgot to clean that particular area <laughs> last week and there's a nice little spider. But if you get too close, it sort of spooks them. Uh, so this lets me stand a little further away with my same macro lens that I use uh, and still get a, a very good uh, macro shot. Uh, and oftentimes, be because the system isn't very bulky, I can handhold it. The image stabilization is, is, is really, really good on something like this. So whether you want to go the crop way or you want to go the full frame way, I think there's uh, something available uh, in each camp. The main lens that I use is... Is this one here? I think I'm gonna put this up. This is the uh, Sony 90 millimeter f2.8 G macro lens. Now, there are several reasons I really like this as a dedicated macro. First of all, it's a dedicated macro lens, so it has one-to-one -one magnification, autofocus, great image stabilization. So if you if you happen to have a camera that doesn't have in-body image stabilization, which which is getting rarer now, but there there are cameras out there with that. This has built-in. Uh, optical image stabilization that you can utilize. I love the fact that it's it's focusing ring, the, the distance is marked and you could go from autofocus to manual focus by simply sliding the ring back and forth. I can't tell you how nice that is when I'm looking through the viewfinder, got the position exactly where I want it and I don't wanna be in autofocus anymore. I just I just slide the, uh, the ring back and I'm manual focus. I don't have to worry about any uh, misregistration when I'm doing any kind of a bracketing uh, shot or combining multiple exposures. That's really, really good for uh, good for that. It also has, now, sometimes some older image stabilization systems and cameras, uh, when you're on a tripod, it doesn't play nice. Uh, so sometimes uh, oh, when, you, when you're on a tripod, you actually have to turn the image stabilization off. Some of the newer cameras, uh, they, it recognizes when you're on a tripod, but it actually has the option just on the barrel to turn image stabilization on or off, uh, which which is I find very very frequently uh, I use some 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 of the older cameras, some of the more manual focus cameras, uh, and uh, it has a little uh, customizable button. Uh, I you can press that. Typically, I I use this for uh, quickly go from autofocus to manual focus without actually having to use the ring. If I'm hand holding something, that's really convenient for that. So this is my go to. Uh, lens. It's it's 90 millimeters, so you still have quite a bit of distance between you and your subject. And if you want even more distance, you can put this on a 1.5 crop body, uh, and you could really stand back because now it becomes a 135 millimeter macro lens. So that's my go-to lens. One thing I really want to point out, uh, you know, which is a little different than some other macro lenses, is the aperture blade. The aperture blade on this particular uh, lens is circular. So I'm showing that. So when the when the when the blades line up, it creates a nice circle image. So this really comes into play when you have out of focus areas. Uh, what most lenses have this sort of uh, conventional uh, flat plates that create the aperture uh, as it comes down, but it doesn't have a nice round uh, appearance. So the bokeh, particularly if you have pinpoint lights or bright lights or even other out of focus areas that are a little bit brighter than some of the surroundings, it doesn't render it as nicely as this very round uh, out of focus areas because of these circular aperture blades. So uh, people don't really think about that. Uh, and uh, you can already, already tell when you're looking at a macro image and you look at the out of focus areas, uh, which is using a, a, a flat blade versus circular blade. And I really prefer the look of these circular blades. And one other thing that people don't realize that, well, you know, polarizer, do you really need a polarizer? I thought that was for landscape photography when you wanna, you know, get the sky looking really blue or 
or get rid of some glare. But this is also important in macro photography, uh, particularly if you're using some external lights. You can you're always going to have glare on surfaces uh, that you're lighting up, or even if even if you don't think there's glare, when you put a polarizer on and you engage it, you realize how much like, glare there really is. <clears throat> and this and a polarizer really helps to minimize that and bring out the richness and the colors of your subjects. Uh, so consider using a polarizer, even though you're just doing macro photography. A lot of people sort of uh, don't think about using a polarizer. They go, oh, it's stopping light. I don't want to uh, have low light. But, you know, you're on a tripod most of the time. So it really doesn't matter if you have if you have to increase the time that you have the shutter open because you have you have you lose a little bit of light from the polarizer. The benefit you get from the polarizer uh, is I far outweighs the the downsides, if you will, of losing a little bit of light. Uh, okay, so here's a piece of equipment that I use all the time. It's called a platypod, uh, and just the base, just the base is the platypod. But they also sell these little extensions, and they're called gooseneck. I think I think B and H uh, sells these. There are different versions of the pl uh, of the plat platypod. I think they have extreme version now. That's great for outdoor stuff. But when I got this many years ago, they had this version called the Ultra. I don't know if, if, if that's still, still available or not, uh, but I've had this forever. And I like this sometimes when the surface is a little, uh, little more challenging uh, if, to use a tripod or if I want to get really, really low to the ground. So I, I sort of use these uh, and you can put the camera directly on top of the plate. There's a little screw mount over here. So it's great. It's great to use as goosenecks to, to hold little loom cubes or any other light source that you may want to sort of direct on your macro subject. Uh, so so this is one of the equipment that that you may not have heard of, but once you use it, you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I've, I've lived all my life without it. So uh, this is what I really like. Uh, and I also use this in conjunction with this particular tripod. Uh, this is the Pixie Evo Mini tripod. There's There are two versions. There's this version and a slightly less expensive version, which is the Mini the first one they came out with. I don't like that one as much because uh, of one simple reason, I actually have it here. It has a built-in ball head that actually will allow your, your, uh, let me see if I can figure this out. It'll allow your, your camera to go 90%. There's a little notch here built in. The, so such a little thing, but it makes a huge difference because sometimes I want to do macro photography in landscape mode, and sometimes I want to do it in uh, in portrait mode. And having that notch right here in the built-in tripod head makes a huge difference. I also like the fact that the legs are somewhat expandable. So it has several places where you can put these legs locking in. So you're not sort of stuck to this one, one size position. You have the ability to change the size of your tripod leg, leg a little bit at a time. And because it goes out so wide, if you look at this, it has a pretty wide footprint. I'm going to bring it out here. Uh, it's super stable. So, and it's amazing lightweight. It only weighs about, I think, less than ten ounces. So, uh, uh, and it holds up to up to five and a half, six pounds of weight. So, this, in combination with the platypod, uh, I use a lot. And here's another thing. Uh, and you may not have heard this, which I also find very, very helpful. In fact, jewelers use this tool uh, quite a bit uh, to hold down to a little piece of equipment uh, so they can uh, so they can work on it easily. Uh, it's called Helping Hands, uh, and it comes with these little little alligator uh, clips on the side. And I use this for a lot for my macro photography involving flowers, or if I want, if I need to hold a a piece of paper in the background, or a or a photo in the background in a particular position, it makes me lets me allow to make minute uh, movements without without too much fuss. Uh, again, these are little assistants, if you will, that that help you uh, hold things in position. Uh, I use this all the time. Uh, one of the one of my most used equipments for for everyday home macro photography. Uh, finally, we talked about holding lights up, uh, and the my light of choice, just because it's so bright, it's so tiny, uh, it has magnetic attachments if you have sort of metal surfaces it has a tripod mount and, and it's a little little loom cubes that you see over here uh, in addition to those loom cubes the tripod is also great so i have a platypod i've got that manfrotto uh pixie tripod and this is typically where i hold my 
um, a light on because that this is the tripod right here, by the way. It's made by Sirui. It's the company. It's 3T. 35k they have different colors i really like the red because it because the night pops nice again it's got this it's got this beautiful wide base as you can see over here and it sort of and it goes like this and you sort of click it into place and it locks and this thing isn't moving it actually even has a little bit of of center column so if you need to raise the light and it's the perfect weight size um uh, to be on a table stand or inside of a little light box if you will uh, because that's the next thing I'm going to talk about is this what's called a studio in a box. Uh, if you want to get great even lighting, uh, this is a great way of doing it. You could even use this in conjunction with the uh, with the loom cubes uh, to get some directional light, yet have a little built-in fill because the directional light bounces off of these walls and fills in the shadows just a little bit. Uh, it creates this great effect. So the one I have is the 28 by 28 inch versions, but depending on your need, they're different sizes. Uh, you can actually close all these areas off and look down through this little opening over here. We can put your lens right through this and get this cool perspective of looking down, down on something. So that's also great. Uh, something that you may not think about uh, is a little syringe filled with water or a little spray bottle filled with water. If you wanna spray your, uh, your, uh, your subjects, like maybe a flower or maybe a CD, uh, remember those things, little CDs? Uh, you can spray it with water, create this beautiful colored effect, have this misty uh, dew drop type of effect with this with the spray bottle. But what I like to use sometimes is just a little one drop of here, water here, one drop of water over there. Uh, you can actually shoot through the water to create some pretty uh, cool effects. In fact, that's what I did for that opening picture, which I'll show you how to do in, a, in, the, in the next couple of slides. I know people are like, how'd you take that picture? I'll show you how I did that. But think about getting a little syringe. You know, it comes in a... Medication bottle, you can get it at uh, at a drugstore or whatever, and uh, I, I I use this all the time. So this is sort of putting it all together, right? So I've got my camera, my cameras, my macro lens, uh, my little alligator clips uh, on these helping hands, my platypod holding the uh, the lights, or my my tripod holding the lights uh, inside of this uh, sort of uh, studio box uh, to go. So this is basically you know, what I create or what I used to create some of the some of the pictures I'm, I'm talking about. And that's indoors at home. Uh, so here is how I made this. So this is a very similar picture to the picture you saw in the opening uh, opening image. So we what I did was on the alligator clips uh, on one clip, I have a flower with the stem and a uh, leaf sort of hanging out. Uh, on the other alligator clip, I've got my uh, flower here with uh, with the dewdrop on this. This dewdrop or this this drop of water that I put on there carefully with the syringe is this water drop of water over here. So this big flower over here, the background defocus flower, and the and the green is actually the green leaf over here and this flower. So this is positioned so that. It's directly in front of this flower and this green leaf. And I'm using the macro lens, uh, and I, I have quite a, quite a bit of distance, as you can see. I'm using the macro lens to focus through that drop of water on to the flower in the background. So that part becomes nice and sharp. The petal that the flower is on looks nice and sharp, but the background is this beautiful bouquet. And again, see how these how the round bouquet creates these beautiful soft edges uh, as opposed to the harsh edges you can sometimes get with uh, with flat uh, 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 aperture rings, if you will. So this is exactly the same way that I created this image. Okay, so what have I done here? If you, if you can imagine, uh, my lens is out here. This is another flower. I put a drop of water on the flower. And in the background, you can actually tell in the background, the out, out of focus background, this is a picture of my wife and me. So that, that this, this is my wife over here. And that's probably me. <laughs> that blob is me. Uh, and in, and that, this is a picture inside a frame. You can actually see a little bit of that blue frame around here. You can see the blue frame around here. And, and this is some stuff that happened to be in my room that, wasn't, that I wasn't very careful about. Uh, but this is just a little bit of something that like, I probably could have taken out. But the, you get the concept that so I'm, I'm, I'm focusing uh, on the droplet of water and the droplet of water itself is creating this kind of 
a fisheye appearance gives a very wide angle appearance of whatever is behind it. But if you focus just on that, everything else sort of becomes nice and soft and uh, and diffuse background. And it creates this really cool effect. As you can imagine, you can do that with any subject you want. And you could you could, you could could zoom in as much as you want. So with this, I wanted to uh, show a little bit of context of a flower, of the dew drop, if, or, the, or the water drop in the picture. But you could you know, crop all the way down to here and just have this this one little area create this sort of this uh, abstract, how did you create that type of appearance? So you're really easy to do. Uh, you know, you don't need everything that I talked about as far as the little paraphernalia with the, but having that alligator clip really helped because I could position this background picture exactly what I wanted on the, on the one alligator clip. And I could position this flower exactly the place I wanted to as I, as I, as I dropped a bit of water on the, on the pedal. Uh, so, right, it uh, you don't need all this, but it makes your life uh, a heck of a lot easier. Uh, there are other things that you guys can uh, use around the house, right? Uh, and this, my son has Legos all over the floor. I mean, my God, I can't take three steps before stepping on a Lego and, and puncturing my skin or something like that. But so I said, well, you know, why don't I use this to my advantage? So <laughs> the picture on your left, what I did was I took one of the little Stormtrooper Legos uh, from the outside. And these are not boulders, right? These are just tiny little pebbles uh, that I got. Uh, and there's a little bit of dirt from outside. I, you know, put it on the, uh, put it on, on the table, arranged the the rocks, made it look like he was in a tunnel. And this is just, if you look carefully, this is just a match. So I lit the match up and the, just the match light itself served as a source of light, uh, this angle light. So there's no other light here except that a little bit of glow uh, from the lit match. And it creates this really cool effect like he's inside of a tunnel or something. And and here's one where we have uh, Luke uh, and Darth Vader fighting. And I don't know if you noticed, the, the astute, astute watcher will notice that this is on a typewriter, an old fashioned typewriter. And Luke is standing on S for sun. And Darth Vader is standing on, what is that? F for father. Oh, I didn't expect that, did you? Son and father dueling it out <laughs> on top of a typewriter. So what I've also done is I've, I've bought these little toy cars. They're, they're tiny. They're like, they're like, I don't know, maybe something like the size of a little sand disc uh, thing, or maybe even smaller, maybe even half the size of that. Uh, and depending on how you arrange things, you can make it look like it's a huge, uh, a huge car. Uh, and and basically, this was this a bridge, a walking bridge that I was uh, that I was uh, uh, visiting. And I took one of the small cars, put it here, and I used the focus bracketing technique. So I said, so I focused a shot here, a shot here. So I focused like two hundred shots between here and here to create that depth. Uh, and still have this this tiny car look like a uh, like a big car, uh, and still have the depth of it being in a in a in, in its environment. So you can see exactly what you what you have in the distance. Uh, so it's not completely out of focus. In fact, it has a lot of a lot of uh, depth, if you will. Uh, and because the car is in the foreground and you're using a macro lens, it becomes quite big. And the fact that you can see everything sharp from here all the way to the here. It, it you you have to use focus bracketing. You cannot create the shot like this with a macro lens without doing focus bracketing. So you can even see some of the textures of the like the snow on the ground. So it's really cool. It, it takes a little bit of time, but that's half the half the fun is thinking about oh you know I'd love to create a shot like this. How do I go about it? Uh, so basically, a tiny car in a nice environment that has these leading lines, great depth, uh, and focus bracketing. So it gives you something like this. Uh, here's another example where I use focus bracketing, but I didn't focus to the entire scene, right? I wanted to give that uh, out of focus appearance a little bit still to the city. So this is in Seattle. You can kind of make out this the Space Needle, the other buildings there. And look at these out of focus vocal balls I was telling you about. Because of the 90 millimeter uh, aperture, they're nice and round. Look at how beautiful that is, as opposed to being polygonal in shape. And the focus bracketing here, I just went from this part of the of the car to that part of the car. So maybe maybe just 20 images or so. And I and I and I left the out of focus part 
uh, the way it is because I really wanted the attention uh, on on this uh, on this car. Uh, and the light is actually one of those little uh, loom cube lights I have over the, here on the side, uh, uh, just just barely lighting lighting it up, not not its full strength uh, on the side, giving us a nice angle of lighting. Uh, and and this was sort of a reflective surface that I that was that was in the area, and you can see some of the building lights here being reflected. So I thought that was a kind of cool effect. Again, at this point, all I had was a little platter pond on one side with a little loom cube on top. My little toy car that I that took with me in my pocket, uh, and then just set it up on the on a on a, on a surface, uh, and took uh, focus bracketed images and went home and processed it. So really, not 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 that much work if you think about it. Here's another one. So I mean, this car, believe it or not, is probably the size, maybe just a little, little bigger than an SD SD card, right? Uh, again. Uh, it looks like it's a it's a pretty big size car, a real Volkswagen bug <laughs> that's been stranded in the middle of nowhere in the Rocky Island, or, or they have four by four tires and they've gone on this again. This is an area of the beach where the 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 pebbles or the stones are quite small. They're not they're not huge. They're like maybe maybe this big or so. But because of what the macro lens can do, it creates this great. Uh, boulder like appearance to these uh, to these things. And again, the trick here, I could have made the shot where I focused everywhere from the front of the car all the way to the back of the scene. Uh, so everything is focused, but I wanted a little bit of mystery on the on the background. So I focused mainly from here to probably about here. And I and I and I and it's slightly defocused here and more defocused in the very, very background. Almost gives it like a portrait type of, of appearance. Uh, and what you still have an idea of what you're looking at, where you are, you have the environment. So uh, these little toy cars, I think, make great subjects for macro photography. Uh, one more. Uh, here, I have actually, this car is also about the same size as this SD card, right? And here, I've, I've extensively used maximum amount of depth of field so that everything, the tiny little rock surface from here, all the way to the background mountains, these are the cascades uh, in the back are in complete focus. And it just happened to be that I got some great light that morning. This is a, a sunrise in Seattle, in an area called Matthews Beach. Uh, and look at how beautiful that. You can see the, some of the light reflecting on, uh, on, the, on the windshield over here. So yeah, so those are just some ideas for you guys to try out. Of course, you can use anything. It doesn't have to be cars. It can be little mini figures of people. Uh, you can use, you know, fruits or other things as uh, as background material or subjects themselves. Uh, really, there's no limit to the creativity that you can accomplish if you just think about it a little bit. Uh, all right. With that, uh, I know you guys must have a few questions for me uh, about about any other suggestions or 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 comments or, or recommendations. Uh, yeah, let's open it up for Q and I. I have a question to start. Yeah. Manual yeah. focus. What's the best way to manually focus? I just started actually using a some legacy glass on my camera and yeah. focus peaking is focus yeah. peaking. It's it yeah. looks great and it's like it's so confident, it's confidence inspiring. And then you're like, well, everything's out of focus. What's the best way to manually focus with accuracy? Right. So I I thought Focus peaking was the best thing since sliced bread. Well, the concept when I first heard about it, yeah. uh, and then I actually used it. Like no matter what camera I've used, the the problem with focus bracketing is it it relies on contrast based focusing. So what it looks at it looks at uh, high contrast edges uh, in a certain plane. Well, I can tell you from experience that you can have something light up that's high high in contrast between itself and the background or, or adjacent structure and not really be in focus. All you're outlining is these areas that are high, difference in contrast, not necessarily difference in focus. So because I'll go and whether you use a different color or different magnitude, like you can have low setting and high setting, it never quite gets it right. So in fact, I turn all of that off because I find it super distracting and in fact, misleading many of the times. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's misleading. And then what I do is I just 
zoom up as much as I can to the area that I want to be complete focus. And I turn every other extraneous information off. And the grid lines are off. You know, the all the little text is off. It's just a nice, clear, blank screen. And this is where having a high resolution optical viewfinder or an LCD happens. You know, people say, oh, I don't need such a high resolution. For macro photography and you're trying to get that precise focusing, that's where, like, for example, Sony has a nine, nine million dot optical viewfinder, which is amazing. You know, like, I, I think I think Fuji is the only other camera that has that on, in their medium format. Uh, but anyway, so that really helps. And then I bracket. Even then, I'm not completely sure. I, I, I focus bracket a little bit. So I said, OK, this is where I want to focus. But let me take five shots. Uh, let, let the camera and I have and I and and I, I let the camera take a few shots before the point of focus and a few shots after the point of focus, uh, because even with that, even when I think I've got it just right, the best shot will be maybe the one or two just behind it or one or two just. So if you really need that that sharpest focus at the one particular point, uh, even with manual focusing, you should do a little bit of focus bracketing. I think uh, another sort of similar issue is well. If I want to focus bracket and I don't have a camera that has focus bracketing built in, what's the best way to take an image like that? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we can manually take these images at certain spots along the along the point that you want to focus. Uh, get a rail that uh, a railing that has uh, demarcations within in millimeters or sub millimeters, and so. You point, you choose a point of focus, and then and then you don't even have to look at the image. You just you just you just turn the little dial and move the railing a certain distance towards it or away from the thing, and you take pictures every so often. You're guaranteed to take it at certain intervals instead of trying to rely on your own eyes to detect. Oh, I think this is just enough. To, you know, use a railing system. Math. It's never wrong. Yes, yeah, never wrong. <laughs> it's more reliable. Sean is asking if we'll post a link to your gear bag blog. I think we'll we'll get that dropped if Danny hasn't already. We have a link to that, right? To the the your gear bag blog. And you know, I uh, yeah. Let me just. Uh, I think maybe also in the chat, I'll try to. Uh, I'll try that. Here's here's here's. I think I, I had it in my clipboard, so I just I just put it in. Okay, perfect. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I think we had it in there. All right. Yeah, we'll get that dropped in there. And uh, make sure I go in here. Let's yeah, it's uh, uh, it's it's it can be super fun, you know. I uh, <clears throat> I, I was just talking to uh, my son the other day, and he's getting into uh, doing some macro photography. So it ends up being a, you know, my fun my son who doesn't really like photography so much, uh, but he really likes his Legos. <laughs> so so being able to sort of combine the photography, so he's getting into that a little bit, you know. He's, oh, that's so cool, Dad! And you could do actually claymation too with the uh, with the legos and macro photography where you have it move every little bit here and there you get this beautiful beautiful background that's that's blurred and you get the little claymation uh action figures that's that that goes really hand, hand do you ever play with with a uh, tilt shift or are you able oh to, yes are you, are you able to do like a like a tilt shift hack with with macro i've never thought about doing it but well you know so uh, it all depends on the minimum focusing distance uh and what you are willing to accept as macro so for example these lego pieces they're not that small so you can make it into a macro. What's <clears throat> what's great about the tilt shift lens is you you change the plane of focus from something flat to something like 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 angled. So, for example, let's say in landscape photography, right? Um, uh, if you take a picture of your foreground flowers uh, at whatever aperture, your background mountains are going to be out of focus unless you have a really large depth of field like F, F22 or F16, even then it's not great. But by the time you get to the aperture, everything is blurry because of diffraction. Uh, but what the tilt shift allows you to do is it changes the plane of focus such that the, the foreground plane is on the, is, on the, is on the flower and the background plane on a tilt is the background part is on the mountains. So the mountain is in focus and your flower is in focus, but what isn't in focus? There's no free lunch. The midground is not in focus. Now the midground, because it's below the plane, is not in focus. But nobody cares about the midground because they look at the beautiful background. Oh, the mountains are great. Oh, the fork, the flowers look great. Oh, that little bit of trees in the in the in the midground. Nobody nobody really pays attention to that. So mm -hmm. it's, there, there's no free lunch with the tilt shift lens. But it's just that the things that people pay attention to in the picture are are in focus. 
Interesting. I'm gonna have to try yeah. that. Ma macro is is so fun. What do you find the most challenging thing with macro? You know, when I first got into macro, I took like close up pictures of everything. I thought, oh, that's so cool. Look at the texture on that. And then it gets sort of repetitive after a while. Uh, and <clears throat> the hardest thing I find is just coming up with scenarios or environments or or techniques or, or taking the uh, mundane subject and putting it in a situation like. Like, you know, when I when I took that Lego uh, Stormtrooper and, and I said, oh, how am I going to light this up? I said, oh, you know, a match, a little little match in the hand uh, is would be great. And so just and I said, oh, that I'm glad I came up with the idea kind of thing. You know, it's just and it and it's very rewarding because you solve a problem and still be creative uh, without uh, with us breaking the bank, if you will, <laughs> by finding all this great uh, <laughs> lighting stuff. So. Just the challenge, the most challenge you find is, is how to be creative as far as the environment goes for your macro photography. I'm so glad you said that. It makes me feel so much better about myself for not sucking because you, <laughs> you kind of think you just throw a macro lens on and everything looks cool up close. <laughs> yeah, it and does then, for a while. <laughs> yeah. And after you get over like the whole like, it's kind of like when you when you get your first DSLR camera and you move up from like a point and shoot or something with a smaller sensor and you're like, oh my God, the background's out of focus. That's so cool. And then right, right. <laughs> after a while, it's just like, okay. And it's kind of the same thing with macro. And it's like, once you get over, like, everyone takes a picture of like the first thing they can find. It's like, wow, fabric. That's what fabric looks like. And then once you get over, <laughs> it really is a challenge trying to find things that are cool. And you see those like, those, you know, like the mystery macro pictures where it's like, what is this picture of? And you have to figure out, you yeah. know, it's like this high magnification macro, but yeah, you know, what I think, and I, what I really works as far as macro, I think, is that if you can get a series of very, very close images of, of everyday fruits or objects or whatever and make a panel out of it, uh, and then mm. and you could actually hang that on the wall and like each, each like three on the top, three on the bottom, I've seen stuff like that. And I go, what is that? You know, that, that the, all six of them in a row has, uh, has an appeal to it that yeah. I think not just a single one of them does. Yeah. And textures, focusing on textures is a big yeah, thing. Exactly. It's like you can take something where you can kind of, it's a little bit easier in the sense of you don't have to worry about composition as much. You can just take a full bleed image of just a cool texture. And the fact yeah. of the fact that it's something that zoomed in is just cool. So, and, and you know, I think people uh, get hung up on the fact that macro has to be, oh, one to one macro or very, very close up. You could just get close without getting macro close and still create great macro esque shots like yes. one, i saw one picture somebody had he took a picture of of just the water coming down from a shower uh, and just sort of zoomed up in that you know with, and it was amazing <laughs> yeah and yeah. i'm gonna get to the next question but before oh, i do sure. on that same vein um a lot of people don't realize that a macro lens is a really good portrait lens so yes. if you want a lens that has you know for the people that are really into detail and getting yeah. like up close headshots or portraits a macro lens is is always great for that I want to and jump to this question yeah sorry, but especially if you find a macro lens against that that has that round aperture blade like mm. that works really well also for portraits because now your background is also creamy buttery smooth uh, and it's great not tip. polygonal yeah great tip uh, Andy joining us on Vimeo is asking, do you ever use flash for macro? So I typically don't, I use light. I use a lot of light, but I don't necessarily use flash. Uh, in other words, I don't, I don't have the strobe going off every time I take a picture, if that's what he's asking, but I do use a lot of light because sometimes I've tried flash photography and for some reason, like if I, and I typically I'll do it for uh, one if I try to do it outside, uh, it is, it is, the light has actually spooked some subjects. Uh, you know, you wouldn't think so, but it actually spooked some in the, in the flower, whether it's the flash going off or it's the sound of the light popping uh, and then and then refreshing. That, that I have had that problem. Uh, and, and as far as I've used ring lights, that's as a nice strong source of light where I have a constant light like the loom, to, loom cube at certain areas. So if you mean flash in terms of strobes going off, I typically don't because uh, I can't also, as I change the plane of focus on bracket imaging, the it's it's harder for me to combine the images because the lighting is off ever so slightly between images that it, that it, that it, that it messes my shots up a little bit. So mm -hmm. I usually I don't use flash photography, but I do use a lot of light. 
Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Light is necessary. I was, I always struggle with the depth of field thing where it's like without focus bracketing, cause I'm lazy. I mean, let's just put that right out there, right there without late, you know, without doing focus bracketing, it's like, you know, do you go for the shallow depth of field and have this kind of fall off? Or then you see some images where you can tell they're bracketed with like 60 images and it's yeah. stacked and you're like, oh my God, that's super impressive to have that depth of field, like all the way through like a bug. Yeah. Yeah. Well, even like, even that's that shot I had of the the little car and with the city also that, that, you know, with the bug, it's, it takes a lot of images, but not as much as with the, because now you're going from foreground to infinity as the steps, right. As opposed to a bug distance going from here to here. Yeah. <laughs> Even though you have 60 shots. So that becomes, so you have to take almost a series of bracketed images, but you know, Photoshop has actually gotten really good before. It wasn't so great. I actually, I had, I had to use uh, a program called uh Helicon focus to combine them. But now I just bring them all in as, la as layers. I select the layers and just say combine images and say stacked and it is great job. Yeah. I'm probably using AI or something. Now. I don't know. Yeah. It's so, it's so, cause I used to have the same thing where if I tried to, I used to try to manually focus stack. Yeah. And it was a, there was always something off and you get like whatever that error message is where it's like yeah. one of the images cannot be. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> the worst i hear you <laughs> it's like it's like when you try to do like you know like a pan or like do like yeah. the, like the brenizer effect or something yeah have, right like, right like where did i go wrong <laughs> i thought i took enough images 47 images isn't enough ah uh, mahesh it looks like we uh looks like we covered it all i think oh, you, you opened us up and and got us a, a little more creative i might have to dust off, dust off my macro lens and see what i can do try and, to, and, and i'm telling try that try that little uh the hands thing you know that I, I really, I, 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 the, the more I play around, the more uses I find for it <laughs> to, 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 uh, to position things a certain way, certain background. You can actually, you could print a background if you want to, and, and have the, have it hold the background, so you can have that as a. <laughs> that's, that's what I need to do. I got some Lego stuff here. Yeah. I have to order something. Order my my son some more, yeah. and just play some around. Hot, with hot wheels or something. You know? There we go. I got it all right there. <laughs> Hasn't cleaned up his toys in forever, so. It's all right there. I got a macro studio on my floor, 24 hours a day. Okay. Let's go. We're ready. So Mahesh, huge thank you to you. Of course, the Sony team for always supporting what we do here at the event space. And to all of you out there, of course, you know, we always do it for you guys. Thank you for watching. Thank you for getting your questions in. All we got for today, another rendition of the BNH virtual event space. Now in the books, catch on next time. Thanks, guys. See you next year. Yes. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.